all, and thank you so much for joining us here on Expanded Perspectives with me, Cam Hale. And, as always, sweating it out, trying to keep from melting, Mr. Kyle Filson. How's it going, everybody? Yes, I'm here in Skeleton Studios on a blistering hot Texas day. Ridiculous. It is quite warm. Um, warmer than normal. So, I don't know what to expect <laughs> For the fall and the winter coming up, but I hope it is a lot cooler. I'm looking forward to it. The kids are back in school. I'm not used to that. You know how when school starts, it takes a couple weeks to kind of get acclimated to the new system. So I felt totally discombobulated all week. It's just weird. I'm not used to it. Everybody in the house is getting up early. We're all summer long. They stayed up all night. They slept all day. You know, they're on that summer schedule. So vampire schedule. Trying to get back into the into the groove. But uh yeah, man, uh trying to prep the deer stands and stuff like that <laughs> for yep. the upcoming season. But man, it's tough when it's this hot out because you know, I don't want to be out there driving T post and setting up stuff. It's a hundred and ten. Yeah. Oh yeah. It was one when it one fifteen here yesterday. Yeah. I was called you or text you last night. I was shooting my bow and it was like nine o'clock at night and I was like using the little bit ambient light from the the it was ninety five degrees. And even then, I was just like, man, I just I'm burning up. Yeah. I shot like three rounds We're and so then I was old. like, I'm good. I'm good. Went inside, right? Hey, our hearts and everything goes out to Maui. Oh my gosh! Jeez. Look, I'm gonna, I'm wow. dumb, so I don't even know how something like that happens. In yeah. my mind, I think of it as being like a wet tropical jungle. I'm like, how did a fire get started? That was but, me. But you know, it's all the structures and the yeah. buildings and things like that. Man, it's terrible. You know, I feel, Dude. I feel so bad. I've never, and I've never been lucky enough to go to Hawaii. My wife went a couple years ago, trying to get me to go, but. I don't know. I see all those videos of kayakers getting attacked by tiger sharks, and I'm just like, man. I'm out. It's a beautiful place, but surfing, I'm out. Uh, you know where I'd like to go surfing is that place in Waco. Where yeah, it's like the a, cable park. It's like, a, it's like a lake, right? I'm not scared of catfish. It's yeah. the big ones with the teeth. It's the, Yeah, it's like a cable park where they pull you around. You get to like, yeah, they do all that cool stuff. Because surfing looks amazing, right? And But I'm just like, I don't care how fun it is, but there's monsters underneath that will eat you. When I was about 13 <laughs> years old, I used to surf like weeks on end. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but it was on, like, the Nintendo. Remember that TNC oh. skateboard and surf game? <laughs> yeah. That's the only place I'm surfing player. That's it. That's, That's funny it. enough. I remember that game. That yeah. was amazing. That was you a, had the tiki mask on? You had the dude with the tiki mask riding on there? Yeah, yeah. TNC surf designs. Yeah. Is that even a brand anymore? I don't know, but I used to have a bunch of those shirts because I liked Everybody all the crazy did. stuff. That was, man. like, the cool thing to have. Yeah. That, and you had, like, you had the Hard Rock Cafe with different cities no, on it. See, you misunderstand me. I didn't have them when they were the cool shirts to have, okay? Uh, <laughs> I was a little behind the curve. Now there's some kid in Africa wearing that TNC that, Surf yeah. Designers t-shirt, right? And I'm jealous because I want one of them. Yankees ball cap. Yeah. I'm sure they're still around. I'm sure you can go in there. You could search on the web. You got to find out about all that. I'll bet. I'll Look, bet. I got to share something with you. Look, we started talking about all the, the white-eyed kids and the black-eyed kids and the people trying to get in and get out. Listen to this story. Sure. For all of y'all that like to get out and do a little shopping in your local areas, this is in early February of 2017, something really unusual took place. I was in the local Target, or Target, if you will, in Philadelphia suburb shopping with my daughter. And as we walked down the aisle on our way to the electronics department, I noticed a young woman ahead of us, about 20 years old or so. Absolutely nothing remarkable at first glance. She was thin, had long, dark brown hair, t-shirt, sweatpants, and sneakers. It appeared that she was biting her nails because her hand was up next to her mouth. And as we got closer in passing, there was something weird about her gait. Her stride seemed to be long and exaggerated. She's a little over five foot in height, so it just looked odd. Well, as we got closer, what it appeared to be nail biting was actually her biting her fingers, to the point where there was blood visible. As my friend passed her, the woman turned and looked at her as she went by, and her eyes went jet black. She then gazed at me, staring me down as to intimidate me. It was like nothing I'd ever experienced, and a thought came to my brain. I'm not scared of you. I know what you are. My daughter says I was staring her down like she was when she was staring back at me. I walked by, ignored the woman, and just kept going. As we continued, my daughter stopped and bent down to tie her shoelace. When she did so, she glanced back at the black-eyed woman walking away from us. She told me when this woman then turned back to look at us, her head flipped back real fast, right? Like she's whipping her head around. Mm-hmm. But it went completely around. She's looked what? like spun her head. Like an owl? Yes, like an owl looking over <laughs> her shoulders. Said it frightened her daughter so bad that her daughter popped up and was asking her, begging her mom to take her home. 
I now feel as though this was an evil being. The negative energy was palpable, very intense and frightening. I've never really believed in this black-eyed people phenomenon, but I now know that they exist, and I am confident that they are demonic and take on the form of humans. Yeah, I believe they're demonic as well. Dude, it's got to be, right? But now, what? first of all... Chewing on our own fingers. Well, it almost sounds more like possession. That's true. Right? It right, almost yeah. sounds more, and I hate to even use this, but it, you start seeing people that look like they go down and they get down the rabbit hole of, of heavy and intense drug use. Yeah, yeah. It looks real easy for a demon to hop into one of those. Well, I'm sure it's right? easier, right? Yeah. Because, because you're, you're weak and yes, you're vulnerable. Exactly. So and maybe... Maybe that's what's going on. Man. I don't know, but it's, look, disturbing enough, right? Right, right. Disturb, anything with the the solid black eyes. But I like how they said they saw him go black. Yeah, now that's cool. And that's the whole the wild. head spinning all the way around. Yeah. That happened in uh, The Exorcist, too, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a good movie, and it's a movie that stands up. That you, is a crazy you film. You ever go back and watch uh, old movies, and they're just not very good, but... Man, that's a good one. I watched it not too long what ago. What about Rawhead Rex, man? A banger, right? It stands up, right? No. I don't remember that. All I don't remember is like, baptize me. Yes. I remember that scene. <laughs> what was the other one with the, the pumpkin head where the, kid, the, the farmer's yeah. son gets run over? I will tell he, you another show that I like. The original Swamp Thing. And the return of the Swamp Thing. Yeah, I thought they were remaking that. I don't know, but when the return I is ridiculous, I but I love it. I could have swore Luke showed me a trailer for the new one. But I think was, you're right. But it was like two or three years ago, and I never, I guess I never saw that came way. out. Yeah. Shucks. Man. Bummer. Uh, check this out. It yeah, says, hey, guys, me. I hey. recently heard you two talking about purchasing a metal detector. <laughs> Heck yeah. And getting into the hobby. <laughs> it reminded me of some strange experiences my husband and I had that all started while metal detecting. All right. Well, we're out on that. Thanks. Thanks for the heads up. My husband had just purchased a brand new metal detector in 1999, and we had never made a hike across the street from our cabin before. We chatted and agreed to try out both hiking and taking turns using the detector together. I told him we could look for old gold miners' treasures and stuff like that. Really, the canyon had been logged in the late 1800s for redwoods, and we knew even finding some old loggers' things could be fun. So we had a good breakfast on a Saturday morning and took our happy female Dalmatian along by leash, heading west on the paved road. I had been watching this side creek destination for months on my drives out of the woods. It seemed like the perfect natural access point because I knew the acreage across the street was private owned and was kind of steep. There is at least 1,400 acres and all of it faces north, which follows parallel to the paved road. I'd seen some deer in the mornings up this Thread Creek Canyon and it was quiet there. Some neighbors lived on that side of the road, but only down by the pavement and the whole canyon is so quiet that it would reveal sounds very far away. One could tell the activity of which neighbors were coming from home from town or leaving, etc. So we began our hike at the point of this unnamed creek, marked by a no hunting sign. Nothing said private property or for us to keep out, and there was a lot of small creeks down there, so we went in. This one pond, before meeting the road, has it some drainage that drains under the pavement to a lower main creek that flows out to the Pacific Ocean. We were keeping respectfully quiet, and my husband was wearing his headphones and was detectoring away. I was enjoying the smells of the redwoods and big leaf maples and looking at my dog, enjoying the walk. It's always wet on the ground around here, with thick stuff to hike on, but the understory is pretty sparse in this area because the height of the mountain blocks the sunshine. We are accustomed to the steep, slippery terrain on our side of the road, too, and we'd usually dress in layers for the cold, and sometimes there's too much sun or there's specific winds. Some granite grains and many thick needles of the redwoods to hike on makes for quiet hiking, too, unless you snap a small branch. About 20 minutes of enjoying this beautiful creek area in the morning, sun peeking through some of the treetops found us standing around at a lower creek point. I was looking up at some of the boulders and fallen trees to help in picking out a good hike zone for us. My Dalmatian was always good off leash on long hikes that I took anywhere in California before because I started her on mountain hikes and rides in the Sierras when she was very young. Now we were living in the coastal range near to the Pacific, but I chose to keep her leash this time because the property was privately owned. When I asked my husband if he was enjoying the detector, I noticed he could hear me without removing his headphones. He seemed like he was already comfortable with the new toy, and he was busy adjusting knobs, 
to read for what else, gold, while looking to me for the direction of our destination. So I described and pointed the fine scarred trees up the slope that might be a good place to reach. He agreed that would be fine. I could already tell that he would not be able to use his detector, though, while needling and scrambling up this creek, this creek-like climb, and that there would be places where hiking would be all you could do. You couldn't detect stuff and hike at the same time. It's kind of tricky. So I was prepared to hold the machine while he would be picking his route up the creek. We were just committed on our way from this flatter bottom ground to just begin ascending the slope up when we heard a huge growl sound that made us stop in mid-stride. All three of us immediately checked to our left where the sound had come from. This would be to the east in direction. I immediately asked my husband, Did you hear that? He was still looking in that direction with his mouth open, but he didn't say much, just a gesture of sound. It was clear to me that he heard the growling noise and the vibration of it had come to my high ribs around my heart. Now, I've never heard this yowl before, but my mind told me, that is Bigfoot, and he's letting you know you are entering his hunting grounds. We then checked to our right, still not one bit of movement or any sounds. We looked everywhere, couldn't tell where the sound came from, but it sounded close. My dog was checking around just the same as we were. I thought the air was even quieter now. I talked to my husband very low, with only one of my eyebrows and facial expressions moving. He was looking back to my left and higher and lower. He had been a soldier in the army, so I kind of relied on him to tell me if there was any danger ahead. But I felt strangely interested in reaching that point above, so I eventually just began hiking again. We just hiked straight up the creek, anyway, and reached those burned-out trees, which were first-growth redwood stumps with fire scars. The quiet was almost too loud somehow, if that makes sense. It felt creepy and shadowy for an early part of the day. We had stopped all of our conversations. My dog was even walking polite and not wanting to pull on the leash or walk off. We took a moment to discuss where we were heading next when suddenly there was an obvious flat grade in the east direction. It made all the steep hiking worth it as now we were able to just head east far too easy. We had found an old logging road, I guess. It was completely covered in fallen branches and needles and leaves of maples. A husband enjoyed using his detector on this road. At one point in the road, we had to crawl through an area of growth. The tunnel was the size of a mountain lion or a wild boar, maybe. So it was a bit creepy knowing that we were using its footpath. I don't like guns on hikes, and this was above the point of where our own cabin down below us would be. Another reason I do not want to shoot in an uninhabited area, one cannot see how far a bullet would travel if they missed their shot. You can see to an edge of the slope below, but not all the way down to the pavement. The few times I have heard a neighbor take a shot at something, the sound of that crack relays over and over against the canyon walls. After our crawling through some scrub brush across the old dirt road, we came out and realized that now the hiking was really flat and usable enough that we could pick a point down below or up above to use the metal detector. I suggested he try scanning inside some of the old burned out stumps. We decided to walk down down the slope and the next time we came to an area of brush growing across the logging road, that was when we noticed something strange. There were some huge branches leaning into a redwood. I just had to get to that tree, that's all I knew. Once there, it became obvious that a large eucalyptus branch had been purposely shoved into a lower arm of the second-growth redwood tree. We both tried to nudge it to see how tightly it was placed there, and it was too solid for both of us to even budge. We've never built a lean-to before, and even then, I was just learning what one was myself. The only eucalyptus trees are those that were planted an eighth of a mile out at front of this canyon road. Leftovers from the days of logging the country here and necessary for firewood and trains, those were not around. There were other branches of maple and pine shoved into this lean-to, and yet it was not luxurious. It had many areas of open and no added wind protection, but it was a huge undertaking to create this one, no doubt about it. It was no doubt to me that it was not put together by one person or even two. I was confirmed now that we had been in an area of someone else's domain. I did feel bad about that later. 
So we had our fill of trying to nudge the heavy limbs, and we walked back upslope and continued east on the flat road on the trail above. We did find some old items like a very rusted out cast iron skillet inside one of the tree stumps, and some old ashtray from a logger's truck, and some bullet casings, and even a toy gun. It had been about two hours that we had been walking from our house now, and we were not talking about the howl noise, but we were quiet and checking our back and looking around anyway, since this was all new ground. We did try to ascend that north-facing ridge, but it was too extreme to just casually finish in one day. We knew we could always prepare better for it another time. The higher tree line did not begin to change from maples to redwoods as fast as we thought it would. The thickness on the stuff on the ground was very moist. This had been a very damaging rainy season. Residents in the canyon had been stranded at their homes when the Highway 1 had eroded from the rains and floods. Crazy to realize that wildfire is also the other natural danger here. Everything is so soggy wet now in the summer. This was the first time we ever tried to live in this canyon, but we knew that there were some natural dangers, like a redwood that fell one night. It made us bolt upright out of our sleeping state. The ground really shook, and in the morning, PG&E had come out with chainsaws to open the road. You just accepted that once in a while when you live out here. I was very resourceful to always keep hot water ready on the hot on the wood stove and large cauldrons to add to our daily baths and just in case. Anyways, back to our hike. As we were walking, it got quieter, very quiet. And I noticed a strange smell, too. It smelled like a wet dog. It was very it was odd, though. It was not quite the same. And again, we heard the strange growl. This time, it was not that far away. Maybe 50 yards, maybe 60. But it was so dense and thick where we were, we couldn't make out any shapes or what was, what was causing it. I asked my husband, is that a bear? And he said, no. I said, is it a mountain lion? He's like, I don't know what it is, but we better get out of here. So we had ended our metal detecting and our nice morning hike. We knew it was time to get out. So we quickly retraced our steps and left the woods. Once again, the sounds of the forest returned and we made it home. Now, I don't have anything cool to tell you, like we didn't find any hair or any footprints or anything other than that strange looking lean to we found, but we definitely both heard the growls. I believe something was following us in the woods that day, and perhaps that lean to is its shelter. Is it Bigfoot? I don't know. We didn't see it, but that's what it felt like. I hope you enjoyed my story. Good luck metal detecting, and uh, I appreciate your show. Choice. Wow. I don't know. That's creepy, right? Might have been the Glimmer Man because you couldn't see it. Couldn't see it. So, again, this is one of those stories where there's no physical proof. But, you know, it's almost like certain Bigfoots are nice and happy, and some of them don't want you in their area. It didn't throw any rocks at them. It didn't do anything like that. But, you know, I, I don't believe it would be a person just jacking me. That's a good way to get shot. Oh, you know yeah. what I mean? In the woods and stuff. Uh, speaking of getting shot, sometimes... Uh, certain people are armed and they may want to shoot. Let's take a break. And when we get back from the break, I'm going to be talking about some strange encounters that police have had with the paranormal. Stick with us, folks. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. Law enforcement personnel are criminal investigators trained to navigate through a world of deception in order to separate facts from fiction. But what happens when these professional witnesses encounter unexplained phenomena? I mean, who makes a better witness than a cop? Since police officers are skilled observers who regularly delve into the unknown, it's no surprise that some of the strongest paranormal encounters we've ever heard of have come from police officers. We talk about it all the time on this show. We cover all kinds of strange and unusual sightings from all over the globe. Yes, I said it. Globe. From all sorts of people 
but some sightings seemed to be more credible based on who the eyewitness was. People who are trained observers, like police officers, fighter pilots, astronauts, scientists, and more. Now, I'm not saying none of these types of people are incapable of lying. Certainly not. There are bad people, dishonest individuals in every profession. But for most of them, coming out with an outlandish sighting, even if true, doesn't help their career. In fact, it probably hurts their reputation. That is why so many people don't come forward with their strange sightings. Luckily, this seems to be changing. Through the popularity of podcasts and television shows, people are starting to feel more and more okay coming forward with their strange experience. They feel more accepted and less likely to be judged. Think of the countless sightings that were never shared with anyone over the last couple of generations. But back to today's subject, police and the paranormal. In the majority of Western legal systems, the major role of the police is to maintain order, keeping the peace through surveillance of the public and the subsequent reporting and apprehension of suspected violators of the law. They also function to discourage crimes through high-visibility policing. And most police forces have an investigative capability. Police have the legal authority to arrest and detain, usually granted by magistrates. Police officers also respond to emergency calls, along with routine community policing. Police are often used as an emergency service and may provide a public safety function at large gatherings, as well as in emergencies, disasters, search and rescue situations, and road traffic collisions. To provide a prompt response in emergencies, the police are often able to coordinate their operations with fire and emergency medical services. Most cops will tell you they've seen it all. It's the nature of the job to be exposed to virtually everything America and the world has to offer. From the weird to the hilarious to the disturbing. But what about the paranormal? On today's show, I'm going to be talking about some strange police encounters. Let's begin. Even when I was a police officer at a military installation, I always looked forward to working the night shift. We avoided almost all of the nonsense that the day shift had to deal with. And the few things we did encounter were typically rather intriguing. Most bases have alarm systems installed in their buildings, and those systems are wired directly into the office. As soon as we receive an alert activation, we lock down the base and go to the building in question to determine whether or not we can gain entry. To find out if the alarm went off by accident, we lock up the building and check all the entrances and nooks and crannies we can get to. Now, one day, I was out on patrol alongside my Alpha, and we got a call to go check out an elementary school alarm. Next, we lock down the premises and report that everything appears to be safe. In such a case, you continue your patrols with more to do. Following a period of 15 to 20 minutes, we once again get an alert signal. We go back outside to see that the maintenance door into the boiler room, or whatever, it has been opened with nothing inside. We bolted the door and left. Still, another 20 minutes, there's yet another warning siren. When we arrive there, the maintenance door is locked, and all the others are too. The coast seems all clear. All systems go. This time, my friend and I are going to sit on different sides of the classroom and keep an eye out for anyone who could try to pull the alarm by tugging on the doors. While waiting to go, another alarm goes off. So we sit and watch it for a while. We ask to be permitted in and are directed to the on-site building manager who will assist us in securing the premises for our arrival. It's probably around 3 a.m. As the building's custodian arrives, we begin our walkthrough, inspecting each classroom and each maintenance room, and eventually notice that a door to the maintenance room is open and illuminated. This space is a little bigger than a walk-in closet. We go down and 
We peek inside. No one's there. And the door locks behind us. We peer inside and see the solitary water imprint of a child's bare foot, its left foot in particular. The fact that nobody ever reported a kid missing and the facility was empty and locked up, well, it gave us the creeps. Nothing came or went, and we examined the whole building. It scared the very daylights out of us, but to this day, my partner still won't set inside that institution. To that end, deserted educational institutions are very eerie. During his time, my grandfather served as a police officer. In his later years, he worked as a detective and on several murder investigations. However, he was called out late at night to investigate reports of gunfire in a dilapidated home. So far as I can gather from what my grandfather has told me, he and his partner were the ones who got the dispatch call and were therefore the first to arrive at the residence. There was a broken gate in the backyard, so they went through it to get to the home. They prepared to defend themselves after hearing gunfire. There's been one unarmed guy trying to unlock the door to the residence when they arrived. My grandpa's companion went after the guy, but he managed to get away. That's hardly the creepiest thing, though. Grandpa checks the glass to see whether the intruder was attempting to reach someone inside. Now looking inside, he finds a silhouetted figure standing there, just staring at him. While the guy inside looked to lift a gun, my grandfather yelled, Police! Don't move! With his gun up. My grandfather recounts, Well, I hadn't had someone draw their gun on me, and I started to think, What about if I don't fire before he does? And his adrenaline was pounding. My grandfather then ordered the guy to drop the weapon now, or he would be shot. The man remained still, absurdly quiet. My grandfather ducks behind some bushes to the right of the window and radios his buddy, who's trying to outrun the guy on foot. Expecting his teammate to have completely vanished and got a spot to hide, he bursts out from the right to attempt to advance before his buddy returns. To investigate further, he draws his firearm and leaps out of the vehicle. But as he raises his pistol to his head and peers through the window, there is this man still obscured by darkness and aiming it squarely at him. There's complete silence for what feels like ages. My grandpa's adrenaline is racing as he yells, drop the gun and get out on the floor. Again, my grandfather claims that due to his eerie silence, he now thinks it might be a ghost. And then he notices the attacker is carrying identification in the form of a badge. He stated, This shook me out. I wondered whether my colleague had made it inside and was just toying with me, or if this individual was impersonating a police officer. He then yelled, Drop the weapon! Get on the ground! Repeatedly, indicating the floor with his gun. Additionally, the phantom guy pointed his gun at me. It's at this point in the narrative that my grandfather sums up the whole ordeal best. It was a cloth mirror. I got myself all worked out about my own stupid image. The headquarters for my unit is housed in a former hospital from World War II. The spacious basement serves as a gymnasium and has plenty of room for storing extra belongings. On one side is the gym storage area which has a few cages with various pieces of equipment inside. And on the other are the changing rooms, complete with showers. Since there was nowhere else to put a drain, the former autopsy room now serves as the men's shower. The structure is supposedly haunted by a headless nurse. It's not the kind of ghost that jumps out and scares the living daylights out of you. Rather, It's the kind of ghost that does very freaking subtle things, like making you question whether you really saw anything at all. Aside from one particular case, of course. Once, after everyone else had left for the day, a sailor was working out at the gym. 
After completing his workout, he showered. After he finished washing his hair with shampoo and opened his eyes in the shower, he saw that the water near the drain was a strange shade of red and believed that it must be dirt. After he was through showering, he looked again. A crimson color that shouldn't possibly be dirt. Unquestionably, this was blood. It was strange, but he had been in an autopsy room before and believed that the blood was merely left over from World War II, somehow stained in the concrete or tile. A few minutes later, he emerged from the changing room fully clothed. On his approach to the stairs, he saw the light in the corridor towards the storage section, a previous mortuary. And he saw that the light had been left on. Understandably, sailors are prone to forgetfulness, so he went to switch it off instead of alerting the watchstanders. He heard something down the hall as he reached for the light switch to turn it off. For all he knew, it might have been the outer door just around the bend. He reasoned that this may be an intruder and went to check the corner. Someone clad in a plain white dress was crouched over an old-style stretcher with a corpse bag on it, moving it towards the entrance. As he gazed, it halted, released the stretcher, and stared down at him. She hadn't been slumped over. There was just no brain power in her body. Then he got out of there and headed right up to the Ford deck, a.k.a. the lobby. He attempted to explain that what he had just seen to the sailors on watch, but all he ended up doing was rambling. Since he showed no interest in returning inside, they summoned the priest, who subsequently took the man out to a quiet place for a chat. After he collected himself and was thinking clearly again, he related the events that followed. This is the account he told to his superiors when they found out he'd been experienced or he had experienced a terrifying experience. The man was apparently so frightened that he could no longer work there and had to be sent home for mental evaluation. I haven't confirmed this, but I believe there is now an unofficial time restriction on physical training sessions at the gym. I can tell you for sure that after business hours, the fitness center is now empty. I work the graveyard shift as a junior enlisted member, which means I get to patrol the facility alone after midnight. Although I always have a flashlight with me, it doesn't help me feel any better. Creepy, right? It's always these leftover buildings from time that seems to have these phantoms or ghosts still in it. I could only imagine after walking from my deer stand early in the morning or after sunset, it's dark, it does get creepy. Even though I know there's no real monsters out there, it's creepy. So I could only imagine being a police officer patrolling these abandoned, dilapidated houses or buildings at night. It just adds an extra level of creepiness to it. Let's move on. I work at a world-famous hospital. A few years ago, I used to do security there on the night shift from 11 to 7. Well, I had heard about EVPs from coast to coast, and I am a believer, but I need solid proof for something like that if it's really going on, and that it can't be ruled out by logical scientific reasons. Anyways, one night, around 3 a.m., I, was always, I would always get this weird feeling like someone was in the lobby with me as I walked through. One day, or one night, I decided to take a recorder with me and said, If anyone is here, you can talk into this mic right here, and I can hear you. Then I set the recorder down, and I walked away. About 45 minutes later, I came back. I grabbed the recorder and went about on my way. Later that morning, I put on some headphones and decided to listen, thinking to myself, This is stupid. I'm not going to hear anything. But hey, it supposedly worked with other people. So what the hell? I put my headphones on, and then right where I said you can talk into the mic if you want to, say something, there was a response as clear as day. It said, thank you, and nothing else. Well, I was freaked out, needless to say, as this was at three in the morning. I was the only one in this building, and hearing a voice just really got my mind going. So, I decided to take this recorder in different areas and try it some more. And 
I had a lot of success recording dozens of voices at 2 and 3 a.m. It was creepy, to say the least. One time, I even put the recorder down and said, I believe you are here and that you want to communicate. I set the recorder down and walked away. When I came back, I immediately wanted to check what it said. At the point where I said I I wanted to communicate, a loud, raspy voice screams, Stop it! Which freaked me out big time. I later, that night, walked into another area without a recorder, and in front of my face had a wailing, I heard, I'm sorry, a wailing, crying scream in a woman's voice for like five seconds. This literally scared the ever-loving crap out of me. I searched the area thinking maybe someone was in distress, but there were only three rooms in the area, and all three were empty. I hopped on a close phone to call and report what had just happened, and as I was explaining it to the guy on the phone, the scream happened again, right in front of my face. Shortly after that, I moved on and became an EMT and moved on from that job. I like to think I'm a pretty rational person, minus my curiosity getting the better of me, and recording things out of thin air, and having things scream at me out of thin air, which the people on the phone also heard. Those kind of things I can't explain, and that I know that I'm not a complete loon because other people have heard it too. At any rate, that is what I went through, and it was pretty creepy to say the least. I hope you enjoy Roger. And that is creepy, Roger. I uh, have never tried ghost hunting myself. I've been invited more than a dozen times with local groups here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, There's a town not too far from us, uh, just west of our town of Weatherford called Mineral Wells. And there is a haunted house there that's really famous. You can spend money and stay the night there if you want. And my wife is actually friends with somebody who did that. And they said they heard some pretty weird things. Now, I... I don't want to do anything like that because I've heard too many stories of people engaging with spirits and stuff. And then it like follows them home and then they can't get rid of the thing. So, I mean, I've got enough problems. I don't need spirits from the beyond or another plane of existence jacking with me. So I always turn ghost hunters down. I think it's pretty cool. Uh, I know that there are a few TV shows that are pretty interesting. A lot of them look like they're fake uh, and it could be easily faked because of that. But I myself, I'm not into ghost hunting. But anyways, I like the stories. Let's move on. Check this one out. I am stationed in Japan with my wife back in the States. I typically say goodnight to her around noontime in Japan. One afternoon, my phone rang with her number around 1 p.m., the middle of the night for her. Hey, honey, what are you doing up? Her voice was shaky, a forced whisper, and almost a near panic. There's someone in the house. My heart instantly started pounding. My hands started shaking. I had to fight back the urge to projectile vomit. I'd felt adrenaline before in a former career as a paramedic and getting into car accidents and such. But this was the single worst moment of my life. From a mundane afternoon at work to realizing the single most precious thing in my life might be in grave danger. And I'm on the other side of the planet, totally helpless. Grab your work phone, get in the closet, lock the door, and call 911. That's what I told her to do. Stay on the phone with me. The longest, most terrifying six minutes of my life passed as we waited together for the police to show up. Listening to her stifled sobs, I could hear in her voice that she was physically shaking with fear. In the background, I heard noises like someone was banging doors and slamming cabinets. My emotional roller coaster went from blind rage to despair and back again parabolically about 30 times before finally, finally the sound of an officer's voice in her bedroom saying, it's okay to come out. A tsunami of relief washed over me. I teared up. I was so happy. I was laughing and crying and just reveling in how beautiful life can be. How much I loved my wife, and how amazing it is to know that she is safe. In the background, I could hear the officer. He said, Ma'am, the door to your garage was ajar when we entered. Did you close it and lock it? 
I could hear her answer, yes, I definitely did. My heart rate started elevating again. Suddenly in the background, the cop said, Jim, what the hell was that? Ma'am, stay right here. Now, I didn't know what was going on at this point. I, had, I just assumed that there must have been a burglar. That's why I heard the slamming of doors, slamming of cabinets. They were ransacking the house, looking for anything valuable. And they were still in the house. I mean, at least the cops were there now. And my wife was still in the closet. But there was still possibly somebody in the house. So I just told her, stay there. Just stay with, just do what the cops tell you. Stay there. While this was going on, she was giving me play by play of the cops pulling their weapons and quickly clearing the house. This being a small town, she said there were probably like five cops there. She said the, she said the same banging noise started up again. Doors slamming, cabinets opening and shutting, drawers being jerked open. While the cops were talking to her, the noise continued while they cleared the house. At this point, she said, they were clearly getting freaked out. and She was getting worked up again, too. With the house cleared, now a second time, the cops are unable to pinpoint what was making the sound or the disturbances. They went outside to continue to search. My wife went out into the driveway after them and watched as they entered the house next door, a brownstone that shares a common wall with our house. This house was still an empty shell under construction. Weapons drawn, flashlights up, Probably the entire police force in this small town now breached and cleared an unfinished home under construction. After a few minutes, she said they all came out laughing. There was a piece of plywood leaning against the common wall at a precarious angle, being blown down by the wind. Apparently, it was being blown in such a way that it would come off the wall and slam back down again. To my sleeping wife next to an open window, it sounded like someone was trying to break in. The door to the garage opened mysteriously several more times after that, before we figured out that it didn't close and lock all the way due to the weather stripping. We still laugh about it to this day, but man, that thing was scary. Even the cops said they were freaked out by it. So there we go. What you initially think is a ghost or some kind of poltergeist activity turns out to be something very mundane. You can see how easily you can get worked up and there's actually nothing there. I know this has happened to me several times, right? You just hear a strange sound. You, it it kind of freaks you out. You start getting worked up and then you start almost imagining things. And this is why we talk about, you know, some people, they're not lying when they have an encounter. They just are mistaken. And if you're unfamiliar with the outdoors or wherever you can be or wherever you're at and you think you see a Sasquatch, you may not actually see a Sasquatch. It might be a brown bear. Now, the person's not lying. They're just misinformed. We can all make mistakes. Let's move on. A little while before Brandon joined the police force, he recalls working for a hospital as one of the late night security guards. The job was perfect, except for the fact that during the graveyard shift hours, he would be all by himself. On top of that, the hospital was completely abandoned during this time. A year before he started working there, the hospital had been constructed a brand new building that had replaced the one that had been built in the 1900s. The building was fairly large, standing about five floors high. Once the hospital was cleared out, all of the patients, doctors, and nurses left. They didn't tidy anything up on their way out. All of their tools and supplies were left right in place, as if they were trying to leave in a rush. Everything was still there. From the half-empty coffee mugs, wheelchairs sitting around in odd places, and even uniforms still tucked neatly away on a rack. Everything was still there, just collecting dust. Brandon had always enjoyed working the graveyard shift because he didn't really scare easily. Every night that he had to work, he would make his way through the halls. Usually, he would walk, but every now and then, he would ride in a wheelchair since he was alone and the building was supposed to be empty and unused. For some reason, he would have to keep relocking and closing certain doors. 
He would start on the first floor, make his way up to the remaining four floors every single night. He didn't begin to get nervous until about an hour after he'd walked down the hallway to turn off the lights and do patrol. This was because he had to close the exact same doors and cut off the same lights that he had already done on his first round there. Another thing that would happen is that he would be going down a hall and then all of a sudden he would hear footsteps on the floor that was directly above him. He would then also start hearing different doors opening and closing. The elevators would start to move from floor to floor without him touching any of the controls. The phones would start ringing out of nowhere, and even the nurse call lights would start blinking. Despite everything that was going on, Brandon stated that there were only three times that I got this really scary feeling. The first time he got the feeling was when he had been checking the offices on the fourth floor of the hospital. One of the lights was on in the locked hallway for some reason. Brandon knew it didn't make sense for the light to be on because the hallway hadn't gone through any renovations since it was originally built in the 1900s when electricity wasn't even used in the hospital yet, back in the olden days of the original structure. Nevertheless, he went to unlock the door and turn off the lights leave the hallway, and relock the same door. As he was about to leave, he heard the sound of the light switch. Peering through the frosted glass, he saw that the light had its turned itself back on. Terrified, he decided not to go back to the hallway during the remainder of that night. The second time that Brandon had a creepy experience was when he was riding the elevator back and forth between the floors. As he was taking the elevator to the fifth floor, he heard the sound of laughter and talking. The higher the elevator went, the louder the voices sounded. As soon as he got to the top floor, all the noises completely stopped. Every single light on that floor had been turned on, including the patient's rooms. Brandon was stunned because he knew for sure that he had heard these voices. Determined to find out who it was, who was playing a prank on him, He said he was going to check high and low, and he did just that. And there was not a single living, breathing person in that place except for him. The worst encounter came on a third night. It started off as being a normal, average night. Brandon was on the first floor, locking all the doors in the corridor. This particular door had glass in the center, but the back of it was covered with a few strips of white tape. The room that the glass door led to was pretty dark, and the hallway that was close to Brandon had a dim light shining through it. The glass was a perfect mirror to see behind him. Everything was normal until he looked up and saw a full outline of a person walk past him. There was no denying what Brandon saw. Clear as day, he explained. Just a full shadow of a person walked past He claimed that he was petrified with fear for a minute before he ran after the person that he thought he saw. When he went after it, it had completely disappeared. Although he enjoyed his time at the hospital, Brandon was already quite scared with all of his unexplained experiences. Other guards that worked on different days also came back with similar stories. They claimed that most of the same things occurred, with the exception of being that they always saw shadowy nuns or something walk around into patient rooms on the third floor. Wow. Shadow beings, ghosts, whatever, right? Very, very creepy. Check this one out. In the 1950s, in a rural area of southern Louisiana, a plane carrying over 200 people mysteriously crashed in the swamplands below. The crash was so violent that no bodies were ever recovered. And if anything had been left intact, the gators in the area got to them before rescue crews could ever save them. Since the technology wasn't what it is today, the crash left little evidence behind. The authorities never found out what happened on that warm summer night. What caused the plane to crash? They just don't know. The deaths of those killed in the crash were memorialized years later with a statue on the side of the road by the swamp. As with every other violent event that happens, 
rumors, and stories spread through time, claiming ghosts and apparitions haunt that vacant swampland. After so many years, the only remnants of the crash that can be found is the commemoration. Otherwise, the swamp has taken over all evidence of the plane crash, and ecology has blossomed where it was once all charred and burnt. Many people, especially the older folks who remember the horrific incident, refuse to go down that road, especially at night. Reports of cries and walking apparitions have been reported in that area for years, especially on the anniversary of the incident. Nayali had moved to Louisiana from California, accepting a position with their police force. He was an extreme skeptic when it came to anything paranormal and had to stifle his amusement whenever he heard these stories of ghosts that walked down that road near the swamp. The area, in his opinion, was the perfect place to catch speeders and DUIs, especially on the weekends. It was a back road, and people think they can speed through without paying attention. The other officers warned Niali about the legends. They said, don't go down there, man. But he would always laugh it off, figuring they were just trying to freak him out, just trying to scare the new guy, you know, or they were trying to get his spot because he was making quite a few arrests. For days, Niali sat in the same exact spot, nabbing speeder after speeder that came down that particular road. Sometimes he would be so busy that he would stay parked in front of the monument for his entire shift. A few days later, the chief asked Niali to knock out the night shift, hoping they could curb the DUI fatality rate on that specific road. Niali agreed. He liked the solace of working overnight. When his shift started, he pulled to his regular spot and set up his radar. The bars hadn't let out yet, so the road was quiet and the sounds of frogs and crickets were the only things moving in the swamp behind him. As he typed on his computer, catching up on some paperwork, he heard a small thump outside of the car. He stopped for a moment and listened, ultimately going back to his work and figuring, oh, it was just a gator in the swamp or something like that. A few moments later, the sound of scratching moved from the passenger side of the car down to the truck and stopped. Nayali, aware of the creatures that lurked in and around the swamps, thought, oh, it's probably a raccoon or a possum or, you know, something like that. He grabbed his baton and weapon and opened his door, checking under the car before putting his feet down. He walked around the car, shining his light on the ground and around the general area in the swamp. There was no sign of anything in the area, no eye shine, nothing. He leaned down and looked at the marks on the side of the car and rubbed it with his finger. There seemed to be some kind of ash or dust in two long streaks that ran down to the bumper and stopped. At that moment, a breeze ran through the swamp, sending chills up his neck. He laughed it off, got back in his car and carried on with his work. The next night, he followed almost the exact same routine and about two hours after sitting there, he heard the same noise again. But this time, it was louder. He jumped out of the car and looked around, seeing nothing but some jumping frogs. He walked around to the side of the car to find even more black soot smeared across the passenger side. He took in a deep breath, the smell of fuel and something burning stinging his nose. He looked around, thinking something might be on fire but there was no sign of anything anywhere. He thought about the stories he had been told where people smelled the burning jet fuel of the plane that night. But again, he laughed at himself for even entertaining this idea. The next night, his last night of evening patrol, he sat comfortably in his car, watching the road for speeders, once again set up in the same spot by the swamp. Around the same time as the previous nights, he began to hear the sound of scratching on his car again. He jumped out of the vehicle and called out, Who is it? Who's messing around? Knock it off! Everything was silent, but the smell of burning jet fuel 
began wafting through the air. He bent down and inspected the mark on his car. This time, though, it started with a small handprint. He stood up quickly and looked around, the hair on the back of his neck standing straight up. The frogs had silenced themselves, and Niali could hear what sounded like crying. The crying grew louder. As it did, more cries joined, until it sounded almost like a stadium full of people. He looked around, panicking, and he froze. From the swamp, he saw hundreds of glowing orbs that resembled eyes staring back at him, blinking. Between the loud crying, the burning jet fuel, and the glowing eyes, Niali had just about enough of this spot, and he tore out of there, leaving the dust behind his tires. To this day, people still believe they hear the cries for help from those 200 lost souls who died there so many years ago. back with expanded perspectives strange stories strange sightings even if some of them aren't real uh you know sometimes some noises play tricks on your mind and what you think might be a poltergeist or ghost activity turns out to just be the wind blowing a sheet of plywood you know you just don't know well it's uh, here's the funny thing like as, as a kid you want it right like you want that stuff to be real like your mind goes crazy and all that stuff and it sticks with you because it still happens from time to time I always think about like what you had talked about with your beard ribbon around on there and you thought there was something outside the hand. Oh, yeah. We were I was 100% hunt, right? convinced. <laughs> There's something coming. I also think about how many times I thought there would have been a deer or a pig or anything while you're hunting's behind you and it ends up being a squirrel or a, or a armadillos are the worst. Yeah. Right? They sound like they weigh 1,200 pounds. Anything that stinks because your mind, you can't see it. You know, you're following along with all this stuff, that whole deal. So, I mean... I can understand easily how you get shook up with sound, like super simple. Oh, totally, totally. Yeah. You ever heard something in your house, something make a noise that it's never, and you're like, what was that? And it may be something as far as like something fell over in the sink, right? But yeah. you've never heard it before. And you're like, what? How? It's so off putting that you instantly react to it. Yeah, because you know it's not right. It doesn't fit the, and I, I always kind of lean into that too with stuff when you're in the outdoors, when you get those off feelings, right? You need to trust your gut instinct. If it feels wrong, don't go over there messing with it. <laughs> yeah, you'd be shocked at how your senses, how yeah. accurate they can be. But I know what you're saying. There are definitely times where I thought something was happening and it wasn't. You're like, oh, oh. That, I've been staring at that stump for two hours. <laughs> yep. That's a deer. I'm just waiting for him to stand up. And then it gets daylight, lighter and lighter. And then you're like, no, dummy, that's a tree stump. Yeah. You see it every time I, I have to remind myself. And then like, yeah, you'll see the same later, stump. Exactly. And you'll be like, there, what is exactly. that? And you're like, no, dummy. Remember when two yeah. weeks ago, you saw the same thing. Tree deer. <laughs> yeah, it happens, right? You can yeah. convince yourself late at night, especially like watching a horror movie or reading uh, creepy stories that listeners send to you. You can hear a noise and it, because of your state of mind, it changes your, like what you thought you just heard. You're like, wait a minute. No, no. it's because Dude. it's what I'm doing. That's what changed the answer where if that sound happened at 1, 1 p.m. in the middle of the day, I would never assume, oh, man, is yeah. that a black-eyed kid? Yeah. No. It's an Amazon delivery driver, dude. He just That's dropped right. something off on your door. But I keep expecting a black-eyed kid to show up, right? I have to try to play two different people, right? Live two different lives. When I go to the woods, I try to pretend like I don't do any of this. I don't think about this. I don't read about this. Yeah, I nothing. Because if I'm sitting out there in the dark and then it, and I have to get down and come back, right? You're like, bro, what is out here? <laughs> I get yeah. all amped up. 
Folks, I've got a cool story for y'all. Not long ago, we talked about military and Bigfoot sightings and something crazy. This one, I think you're going to enjoy. Lon hooked me up with this. You're going to be a fan of this. Listen to this, Philly. This actually took place in Afghanistan. <coughs> it says, I have a very strange and unusual story of something that we saw in Afghanistan in 2009. I was part of a small unit heading into the southernmost part of Helmand Province, Afghanistan. Our primary mission was to curtail the flow of weapons coming across the border of Pakistan. To accomplish this mission, we had some DEA guys with us as we were attempting to slow the heroin flow from Afghanistan into Pakistan. Now, the Taliban used the, pro, uh, the profits from this heroin sale to purchase millions of dollars of munitions in Pakistan to fight the coalition. So anyway, we're on day seven of a patrol away from the war looking for some bad guys in an area near the Helmand River. Now, there's lots of caves and ruins in that area dating back to forever. It's just an extremely wild place. So one August evening, a buddy and myself are on watch just talking about what our first meal will be when we get back to the States. I look up the side of, of a cliff base and I see movement coming from my left to my right downhill towards the river basin. basin. So I pull up my rifle and look through my ACOG scope and I see a red haired large figure headed down towards a herd of goats. Now, by this time, my buddy also has his rifle shouldered and is seeing the same thing. It was the color of an orangutan. Orangutan. <laughs> it's reddish orange, but was moving on two legs extremely quickly, probably covering 100 meters in and around 9 to 10 seconds across some pretty rough terrain. It was also larger than a man, though I really couldn't tell you how large. It seemed as if the goats were aware of its presence, but they didn't make an attempt to move away. They all just stood there in silence, staring at this thing coming down the embankment. Well, they're not known to be the smartest animals on the planet, right? Goats? goats? Yeah. No. When it, if, if y'all had an old car out there, they'd all be on top of it. It'd be easy to catch them. Mm -hmm. When it reached the goats, goats, it reached down with one arm and pulled one up by its front legs, threw it over its shoulder, then moved to another goat, picked that one up, threw it over the other shoulder. It then started, turned and started back up the cliffside with both goats in tow and seemed to be moving just as quickly as it was when it came down. The extra weight of the goats on each shoulder, not seeming to hinder it in the least. We watched it until it reached an area of known caves and disappeared. This all happened about 500 yards from our position. My buddy and I both looked over at each other. You could tell what we were both thinking. The same thing as what the hell was that? At the end of the deployment, I went in and talked to one of the environmental health guys, and I told him the story. Now, those guys are supposed to be the experts on all the critters and such you may encounter while you're in country. But he seemed to not have an answer for me. Anyway, to this day... I still have no idea what that thing was, but it was certainly not a man. Wow. You know, that's not the first story I've heard of soldiers watching no. something strange walk down and grab uh, goats and, like, walk off with it to eat them or just whatever like any kind of food. Yeah, just, yeah, exactly. That is— That's pretty wild, right? That's very I'm, wild. Like, man, what? just like it. It was just two of them. You don't open fire on it. It's not a threat. Because you don't know what it is. Right? right. No, right. Just because it picks up two goats doesn't it doesn't give you the right to just light it up. You're just watching this thing. You don't want anything to know you're there. It doesn't know you're there, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, if, unless you were in Texas. Now, in Texas, a rancher can kill you if you're trying to steal his goats or his cattle or whatever else. If you're just on the property. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> like, you hop the fence, you get smoked. We're like, sorry about your luck. But over Don't there. go knock on the door. But like I'm saying, in the military, trying to do a military exercise, it's extremely important. Yeah. You see it. You, you can't. What do you do? You just it'd be like if you and I saw something, you can't say or do well, anything. Also, just watch. You know, you don't have the context of what was going on. They could be observing something. Yeah. You, once you start firing, you're giving away your position. Uh -huh. So maybe, you know, you've been instructed under, under no circumstance so you has to make any noise. Unt unless you're shot at. Yeah. So, I mean. Don't do anything. But imagine now you're sitting in the dark with your bud trying to wrap your head around with, and you're not talking. You can't talk. Yeah. Just in the dark going, what in the hell did I just lay my eyes on? Right. You're a gr You're a, an adult. 
You're yeah. an adult in a military situation, trained this whole way, and now you're trying to deal with that in the darkness of Afghanistan. I'll be like, I don't think so. I'm worried about an armadillo sneaking up behind me, <laughs> making me think it's a whitetail. These guys got giant orangutans climbing down the hill. Right? Yeah, that, that's very yeah. creepy. Speaking so, of no. creepy, don't forget, folks, in about two weeks— Hey-o. We're going to be at the Paranormal Roundtable's second annual Dogman Cryptid Conference. There's a bunch of y'all messaged us that are showing up mm-hmm. saying y'all are going to be there. I'm going to have stickers and things like that. It's going to be cool. Me and Cam will be there as long, along with a lot of other people like Christopher Garantano, Lyle Blackburn, Nick Redfern, Josh Turner, Ken Gerhard, mm-hmm. David Weatherly. I'm going to pick David's brain about these this book series he's got, but the different states. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I want to talk to him about some of the ones, like what's he got planning I gotta uh, talk coming to up Ron. next. Ron Moorhead? Yes. Yeah, that's going to be cool. I've never uh, met him before. No, I cannot wait to chat it up. If you want to come meet me and Cam and as well as those, all those other speakers, you know, well, go, you can go to the website. I'll put show notes to it. Or you can just search uh, evenbright.com and go to Second yeah. Annual Dogman Cryptid Conference. It's going to be in White Settlement, Texas. I'm looking forward to it. And and we then, know y'all don't have to come see us, but y'all can come see all those and we'll just kind of be hanging out in the periphery. Sure. Also, the day before that, me and you are going to be at ReaperCon. Yeah, that Thursday we're going to ReaperCon. That's going to be pretty cool. I'm excited about that. I like to look at all the books. I'm, I've got some play money I'm going to bring with me, probably buy some miniatures or man, some cool oh man, books. You're going to go bananas. I'm looking So, yeah, if to you're going to be at ReaperCon, let us know. We're going to be up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll be up there in Denton, Texas. Yeah, we'll spend the day up there running around checking stuff out, see if we can get in on a game or two. Oh, yeah, they got Bucky's up there. They got Torchies up there. <sighs> New York Subway up there. We got a whole bunch of cool stuff to, to go see. Buckies. Always right? got to hit the buckies. Right. Before we get out of here, let's not forget about our wonderful sponsor, HelloFresh. Just go to uh, HelloFresh. No, I'm sorry. It's Expanded 50. Yeah, go to HelloFresh.com yeah. slash 50Expanded. Oh, I missed it. And use the code 50EXPANDED. That's 50Expanded for 50% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash 50Expanded. And if you have any stories you'd like to share with me and Cam, do not hesitate. Email the show, expandedperspectives at yahoo.com. You can call the show, 888-393-2783. That's about all the time we have for this episode. Till next time, folks, be safe. I'm Kyle. He's Cam. Peace, y'all.